All have sinned and fallen short. All have turned away. There is no one who does good, not even one. Out of the hearts of men proceed evil thoughts, wickedness, deceit, pride, foolishness. And the wages of sin is death. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He bore our sins in his body. He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. He will be merciful to our unrighteousness. He will remember our sins no more. When we were dead in our sins, God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Hey, welcome back, Family of Christ Cross training students, to our final session of our Ten Commandments series. Today we're on Unit 1, Lesson 12, and we're going to focus on the close of the commandments. And the close of the commandments is a summary of God's purpose and plans through the Ten Commandments. Uh, so if you can make sure to have your handout ready, you're going to have your key point outline printed off. You can print it off on the resource tab below. And uh, make sure you follow along and fill in the key points as we proceed. So our lesson focus for today is that as Christians, we confess that God jealously guards his commandments so that all within his creation might prosper. Uh, the close of the commandments here is listed below. And so what does God say about these Ten Commandments? He would say, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Like I mentioned, today we're going to talk about how God um, works his plan and purpose through um, his gift of the law for us. And the first question on our key point outline asks this question, what does God say about these commandments and what does this mean? Uh, so God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them, but he promises grace. Remember, grace is God's unconditional love and forgiveness for us. So he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Question number two asks this question, why does God describe himself as a jealous God? And you might have thought, that seems kind of odd. Why would we describe God as being jealous? Look what Exodus chapter 19 says. It says, now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured passion. Keep a note on that word passion. Among all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be, uh, as, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This passage just reminds us of the great love and passion and desire to be in relationship with his people. And so when we talk about God being a jealous God, we mean this, that God refuses to share us with other gods. Now, if you go way back to commandment number one, remember that, was, that commandment is that we shall have no other gods. And again, you see here it's in small lettered, small g, not capital G. Um, when we put other things or other people or other principles before our relationship with God, we are ultimately making them gods in our life. God doesn't care for that. And the reason being is because all other false gods are not able to do what God can do for us, what the true God can do for us. God can give us love, forgiveness. He provides for us. And when we trust in him, he gives us eternal life. 
There is no other being or other thing in the world that can do that. So if God truly loves us, he would not want us to follow those false gods. Therefore, God is jealous. He is passionate about our relationship for us. And for that, we should be grateful. Question number three, what, is, what moves God to punish or bless us? And um, first of all, A, disobedience provokes God to, to righteous anger and punish sin. Um, when you think maybe in your household, when you, when you might break a rule in your home or violate your parents' trust, a parent typically should have the right to be angry, disappointed. Um, and so God has a righteous anger against us when we disobey him, when we violate rules, when we hurt one another, when we hurt God, um, that brings sadness, dissatisfaction to God. And God has every right to be angry because of that. So um, on the other hand, God chooses to bless us. So on the opposite side of his, his uh, um, righteous anger, God also has undeserved grace for us. Remember his unconditional love. So God's undeserved grace moves him to forgive and bless us for the sake of Jesus Christ. And so where God is not only, he's a God of, uh, he, he certainly has the right to judge and to be a God of order, but God is also a God of grace and love and forgiveness. And for those that trust in him, um, he says our sins, uh, like on that video, as, as far as the east are, is from the west, our sins have been removed from us. That's his love and grace. Number four, what is our proper response to God's warnings and promises? We should, okay, so first of all, uh, we should reject all other gods. Hopefully that's clear to you. They cannot provide for us what the true God can. B, we should turn to God in repentance, so acknowledging that we are sinful, that we are not perfect, and we need um, his forgiveness. We turn to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. That's what repentance means. And then C is to seek to know God's will and gladly do what he asks. And so as we, out of love, as God loves us, we want to follow his will in our lives, and we want to love and serve others and do what he asks of us. Question number five, how does, God carry, how does God carry out his punishment and blessings in, in life? And so you might well wonder, if I do violate commandments, what kind of, how does God punish? How does that all work? And so let's explore that first part. God punishes us by, and there's A, B, and C here. So A is he subjects us to the difficulties of earthly life in a fallen world. And so probably the greatest punishment that we experience in life is just living in this broken world. We live in a world where there is a lot of brokenness. There's hatred, there's discord, there's stealing, there's death. And we live in this world, although there's great love and great beauty in our world, there's also at the same time this brokenness. And that what goes along with a broken world is a lot of hurt. And so in a sense, we kind of punish ourselves by our, our disobedient acts as a world together. Um, B is that we, um, God punishes us by authorizing parents and other authorities to discipline us when we have done wrong. And so discipline is the idea of correcting. So discipline is not just punishment, but discipline means to redirect. So how does God redirect us if we um, are disobedient? And so he gives us parents. So parents who um, carry out maybe punishment or consequences for sinful acts, God uses those authorities to help redirect, to correct, bring repentance in our lives. And other authorities, that includes, you know, police and law enforcement, teachers, pastors, uh, and all the a variety of different authorities that God uses in terms of ability to correct and discipline and give correction. And then C is by handing us over to our self-destructive habits and their consequences. And so, you know, when we break God's commandment, he doesn't always protect us from the consequences of our decisions. God can forgive us, but we're still gonna have the consequences of our negative decisions. So we might hurt a neighbor, we might steal something, and it, it, God can forgive us for those things, but it doesn't remove the punishment that might go along with those things as well. So God allows natural um, consequences of our self-destructive behavior as well. So God uses kind of these natural things in this world to provide, not only provide uh, correction uh, and discipline, but to correct and restore us, to point us back. The good news is, so God also, not only, remember, he's a God that punishes disobedience, but he also is one who blesses us in this life. And how does God fulfill his, his uh, promises of his grace? 
Um, so A, um, he provides us uh, the blessing through the earth that we live in, good weather, plentiful harvest. And so we, uh, as we live in this world, we are able to, um, you know, be successful in a variety of different ways in our talents and our gifts, and, and not only, but also by the resources of this world. God blesses us also by giving us parents and authorities to support our life. I'm glad that I had a mom and dad and a family to raise me when I was just an infant. I wouldn't have been able to make it alone, but not only did they raise me from infancy into childhood, into teenage years, they continue to encourage and, and guide and direct me even into adult years. And so God gives us a system to help us um, enjoy and benefit from this world. And then C is that he blesses us with health, with work, with talents, or gifts, and abilities, and family, and possessions. So again, God uses kind of these natural things to be a blessing to you and encourage you in this life. Um, and again, pointing us back to, to Jesus as the author of all these different blessings. Number six asks the question, what ultimately does God threaten against those who hate him and break his commandments? So We've talked about this before, just to refresh her again. So what is, ultimately, what is the outcome or what is the wage of sin in our, in our life? So Romans 6, 13 speaks pretty clearly to that. It says, the wages of sin is death, yes. Uh, Matthew 5, 25 says this, then he, the king, will say to those on his left, he's talking about God, um, uh, the judge here, the king will say to those on his left, depart from me, cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you uh, did not welcome me. Uh, naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. So here we see about this sorting, this uh, separating uh, those who were in Christ or verse, are not in Christ. So um, we see that God is, is one that um, orders uh, you know, either heaven or hell for us, if you will. So what is it that he uh, threatens uh, to those who break his commandments? It's both physical death, okay, and we've talked about that, that um, the death that we experience in this world, the physical death means our heart stops beating and we no longer um, are able to live in this world. That's physical death, but also eternal damnation in hell is talking about eternal spiritual death. Um, I am much more concerned about the spiritual death in hell. And um, physical death is one thing, but I know God has a plan beyond that. So sin leads to some really serious consequences of not only physical death, but eternal death as well. Um, we've talked about this before, and we know that we can't fix this on our own. There's only one person that can fix the consequence of sin, and that's where the good news comes in. So number seven, I'm so glad to leave you with this last thought. Where alone can sinners find rescue from the condemnation of God? So if sin leads to death, and uh, physical and eternal death, and all people sin, what kind of hope do we have? Check out these verses, John 3, 16. You've, you've heard this before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God loves us. He sent his son to save us, and by faith, believing in him, we will not perish. We will not have physical um, death or um, spiritual death, but we will have life in Christ. And then Romans 5, 19 says, um, for, by one man's, uh, for, for by the one man's, Adam's, disobedience, okay, which means we all inherited sin from Adam over time, uh, the many were made sinners, okay, reminding us we're all sinners. So by one man's and specifically Jesus, by Jesus' obedience, the many will be made righteous. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty that we deserve for our sin. So he paid the penalty, died on the cross. By his sacrifice, we have been made righteous. We have, um, our sins have been removed from us. So when God looks at us on Judgment Day, he doesn't look at our sin or our brokenness. He seeds us as righteous, as ones who are forgiven and belong to him. Good news. So I'm going to give you a great definition of the gospel. This is what it's all about. So sin leads to death, but God had a better plan. And this is the gospel message. Because of God's merciful kindness, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to rescue us from our sin and the condemnation we deserve. As our substitute, Jesus kept God's holy law perfectly, suffered, 
died and rose again for us. For us. Therefore, in our cruci- therefore, in our crucified and risen Lord Jesus, we are freed from the guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin, and we are saved eternally. It's that simple. We try to make it so complicated. We think that God will love us if we do certain things right, and God certainly rejoices when we do good things. But the things that are most important, our salvation, our eternal life, overcoming death and sin, is only accomplished through the power of Jesus Christ, simply believing and trusting in him. And my friends, that is good news. And God loves us enough that he did that for us. So I encourage you throughout your life, the Ten Commandments are a great way to remind you of how sin separates and causes damage not only in our lives, but causes damage in our relationships with other people and with God. But God is a God of restoration. God desires to keep you in his fold, and he does that by trusting and believing in him. And God will save and rescue you from your sin. That is the purpose of the Ten Commandments. It's good, isn't it? All right, so for a know what, so what, know what, I've got a, a kind of a modern day prodigal son story. And uh, if you remember that story in, in the New Testament, the book of Luke, um, uh, a story about a father and a son, about a son who goes away from his father and how the father rejoices when the son returns and he welcomes him, him back. And that's a story, uh, it's a parable about God's relationship with us, that God loves us and desires to maintain that relationship with us, even in this broken, sinful world. Check out this video, and we'll see you back in a bit. I got, I just got really frustrated with school. Um, I, I felt, I felt so much pressure with my dad, um, wanting me to do well in school, and I was, I've never been natural at school. I've never made great grades. So my dad was at a uh, meeting at my school with my teachers, and found out that I've been lying about all my schoolwork, saying that I've been getting it all done. And there was a, a project that I just I just didn't do, and he found out about that because I told him I did do it. And while they were gone, I just uh, was at that point where I just had to, like, I realized that I just had to go because I was afraid of him coming home and, and, and yelling at me. I was afraid of what was going to happen. Well, Gene and I got home about um, 7.30, I guess. And my car was gone, which was odd because Mike didn't have a driver's license. He had a learner's permit. So I called a friend of his and I got him on the phone and he told me that Mike had actually talked about running away. So I was at this period in my life where, where I, I was really questioning God's existence just because of all the, all the stresses that I felt like he was putting me through. So as I, as I was going out there, I, the whole time I was just praying that God would reveal himself to me, whether that be in in a, in a car accident or whether I got pulled over. And it was really scary and depressing. And we wanted to just be able to say to Mike, it's okay, just come home. We called the principal of his high school and he talked to some of Mike's friends. They thought that he was going to New York City. So it was a pretty devastating day for the family. We had friends coming over to pray with us and uh, David Thompson actually talked to me and he said, he asked if I wanted to go to New York. I was like, well, I know I gotta do something. So I got to I got to New York the next morning. I got out of my car and I was walking around and I I found myself in Times Square and it was about it was about ten o'clock and I uh, I walked around the whole day and I that whole day I was still I was still just praying that uh, God would show himself to me. I was I brought my Bible, I was reading that. So we drove into New York and it's like midnight, 11.45, and so we split up on two different sides of the street. And um, as we're walking and getting closer and closer to Times Square, there's more and more people, and there's, there's crowds, so I'm stopping on my side and looking you know, through the faces of the crowd, and I think David's doing that on his side, and I just felt like there is really no hope that um, we're gonna find him. Around midnight, I, I was hungry, so so I went to I went to the McDonald's in Times Square. I got some food and I sat down. And while I was eating it, I was I, I stayed there for quite a while because I was I was trying to figure out where I was gonna go. And uh, as I was eating, I see uh, I see David Thompson walk in through the doors of the McDonald's, and he just he 
just looks at me and, and just, he breaks down and, and he comes over and hugs me and he, he, he's saying, oh, Mike. And right about then my phone rang and it was David. And um, I answered and he said, I'm with him. We're sitting in McDonald's across the street. That whole day I had been um, thinking about the story of the prodigal son. And so I took his Bible from him there in the McDonald's and I turned to Luke 15 and I told him, Mike, this is what I've been thinking about all day. And I was just trying to tell Mike that all that mattered was that we were together again. So thinking back to that moment where my, where my dad walked through that door and I, and I saw how much he, how much he cared about me and, and that he forgave me, that gives me a great picture of, of how much God cares about me and how, how, he, how much he forgives. And, and I know that whatever I do, that he still has forgiveness for me and that I can just rest in that. All right, hey, welcome back. And uh, maybe that story rang a bell with you. We have prodigal stories throughout our world. And aren't we, um, isn't it wonderful that um, we have an amazing, perfect father that forgives us and welcomes us back? Uh, some quotes of the day. This one is from Ezra Taft Benson. He says, uh, God loves us. The devil hates us. God wants us to have fullness of, jo of joy as he has. The devil wants us to be miserable as he is. God gives us commandments to bless us. The devil, would, the devil would have us break these commandments to curse us. So just remember that simple formula that sin and brokenness comes from the devil. He does not desire your well-being for you. God, on the other hand, does, and we trust in that. Um, and then Randall Terry says this, once you, were, once you depart from the Ten Commandments as being foundation of right and wrong, you're in a free fall. And isn't that true? When we start making our own rules, we get into trouble with that. And then finally, from uh, this amazing person and uh, human um, that was God who came in human form in Jesus Christ, he says this, all the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and so on are summed up in this single command. So if I were to summarize the Ten Commandments, it's this, you must love your neighbor as yourself. And, uh, the Ten Commandments sure give us that outline how we can love our neighbors and care for them and make the world better. So go out, make the world better, and uh, I'm excited to see how God will use you in the years to come. So our heart knowledge today is the close of the commandments. Um, so if you could put that into your heart and memorize it, that would be great. You can have a parent sign off when you're done. And, um, and then also at home, if you could get together and do your small group uh, uh, discussion on the back page, so get together with the uh, family members, Make sure a parent is one of those uh, part of your family group. Go through the questions and discussion, uh, complete your memory work, and then have a parent sign off at the bottom that you've completed your work and that your key points are all done. You can turn that in later for credit. So again, thank you for joining us in this Ten Commandments series. I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed learning about how God uses his amazing gift of his law for his good purpose in our lives. And may God love you in amazing ways that uh, you can only, can't even fathom. He is a God of great love and mercy and grace. So we'll see you all in our next unit, which will be on the creed. We'll look at uh, who, who God is, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we'll start into that next week. God bless. We'll see you later.